Hello, gentlemen, and welcome to the Foxhole. Got Ben Van Kirkwick, who is an old friend, and uh, two new friends here, and Nick Sierra and uh, Alex Dunn. And they are here to discuss uh, really what's the most cutting-edge investigative work, in my opinion, being done worldwide in uh, ancient history. And it's all by virtue of measurement. So these two gentlemen, um, Nick and Alex, are metrologists, which might be a new word to some people, but we're going to get deep into the philosophy of measurement, <laughs> which is fascinating that there is such a thing, but there kind of is, man. And um, so they're the techs on the show. And then Ben is like I am, a, a tremendously curious person who has managed to carve out um, kind of a second career or avocation or whatever you want to call it of just doing whatever yeah, so. we can find to do to help uncover the secrets of time and man and earth. It's yeah. a, yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun journey. It's a fun, it's a fun space to play in. I'll say that. Yeah. And Ben and I, Ben and I have traveled together folks uh, a couple of times. We went um, to the Epic 2020, never do it again, never be done again. Egypt tour during COVID where uh -huh. us and our little bus were the, um, only tourists in Egypt at the time. So we had a very special, unique trip in 2020, spent a couple of weeks over there. And then uh, just this April, uh, Ben and myself and uh, the Snake Brothers from Texas uh, and a bunch of other wonderful people, some of whom I'm sure are listening to this podcast and can't wait to see them, um, went to Turkey and went to Gobekli Tepe and several other absolutely jaw-dropping, stupefying sites that I had not even heard of, uh, and it's kind of hard to catch me flat on some of this stuff, but I'd never heard of Sogmatar where we went, which I still think is fascinating. But we know and have proven we can talk for hours about that, but we're here to talk about Egyptian vases. And one, I'm going to give you just a straight up question from me, a dumb question. Do you call them interchangeably vases and jars, or have we moved to vases and put aside jars? What's y'all's opinion for what these objects are in general, and how do we name them? Who wants to take that one? You guys? Go ahead. <laughs> I've got, yeah. I, I have an opinion. Uh, maybe I can start with yeah. that. Um, well, uh, first of all, I get... I get all sorts of criticism about how I say either vases or vases <laughs> to the point where I'm a little confused about it, but I'm going to call them vases. Um, uh, th look, vases, jars, artifacts, it, it, the actual uh, range of what you might call these sort of hard stone precision made artifacts, it, it does extend beyond simply the, the vases. Right? So you have these pretty classical kind of vase shaped objects, either like they're either like an hourglass shape. Some of them are a little rounder. Some of them are a little taller. Uh, it does also extend to other things that you might call plates or dishes, uh, even things like the schist disc, with, which a lot of people may know about. Mm. Uh, it has all sorts of um, interesting geometry in it. I mean, if you go back in time to to people like Flinders Petrie, uh, who, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was one of the first people to sort of observe the precision nature of these artifacts. He was He was talking about segments of bowls and dishes. So... Yeah, it's it's essentially a category. It's not just the vases, but it, it it includes a lot of these you know real you know hard stone objects that were found in caches mm -hmm. together. So it's not just vases, but you have these sort of plates and dishes and like bowl looking things that seem to exhibit these same characteristics. Okay, I, I, I want to continue asking kind of just personal questions of you, which I, I guess is the way a podcast should work. You know, these are honest, sincere, not canned questions, but it, it's coming from a place where I'm assuming. Um, that the the viewers of of this new podcast are kind of two o level people, right? So we don't have to give the extensive description of exactly what we're talking about and the, you know, uh, describing the eras of ancient Egypt and all that stuff. I think a lot of people are going to know that, but for those that don't, um, we're talking a pre dynastic manufacturer of these objects, which, um, and I'm going to get to my dumb question in a second which are principally found, and that's part of the question, under the uh, step pyramid of um, Djoser, right? Well, Sakar. Uh, yes, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, there's, so, so it's, it's a bit of both. You have, I mean, I've looked, and I, I kind of in my videos and the talks I've, I've done, I kind of look extensively into the history and context in which these things are found. 
so you have a, a bit of a mix of what you'd call dynastic or early dynastic old kingdom vases the, the vast majority or the largest collection of them it was between 40 and 50,000 of them were found beneath the the step pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara, which is supposedly the, the first pyramid ever constructed. It's a step pyramid. It, it, it's tied into Djoser, who was a, a pharaoh of the third dynasty uh, in the Old Kingdom. So those things, you they're classified as dynastic. However, they do go back for much further in time. And and even even those those objects underneath the step pyramid, they're, they're, it's acknowledged in the archaeological record that they're not actually all of like, Joseph didn't have a mate. He a lot of these were they call them inherited heirlooms mm-hmm. because they they have the names of you know older kings or or some context that places them as like well this is the stuff he ripped off and 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 took from other burials, but they go back like that's the interesting thing about these is they go back well into what you'd call pre dynastic times so before Menes the first pharaoh of the first dynasty roughly thirty one fifty B C so well over five thousand years uh, ago. And we f- we find them in these pre dynastic burials, and and there's there's a bunch of different cultures that are associated uh, with those times. There's a Nadak or Nadak three. I, I'm probably pronouncing that completely wrong, but you know these these older cultures. Uh, and in some cases, I mean, we had a we one of the vases that we were we were playing with and and had in um, is in the collection that we're looking at is is one that that was was found in a burial that's been dated to like. I think it. I think it was like around ten thousand BC. Uh, there's some evidence that these types of vases were found. The, the, the site that I found that goes back the furthest is is one that is around. It's carbon dated to around fourteen and a half thousand years ago. Um, and in you know all of these pre dynastic burials, you know, it's really interesting. It's a very primitive burial. Typically, it's a shallow grave. Somebody's in a fetal position. That's the skeleton. Uh, it's often found with sort of what you call as very primitive pottery. So handmade pottery, not spun on a wheel. And in these burials, we've been finding these crazy hard stone vases and other artifacts. Okay, but they're, so uh, the, the great um, cache of them was beneath Saqqara, but they are found in right. other places in association with burials. Yes, yeah. In fact, so if you think of like forty to 50,000 of them were found in... Um, in one location or in, in a lot of locations, but like there's miles of tunnels and galleries beneath the step pyramid. Uh, well, I've been down there a few times. It's amazing. Uh, and, and you're talking like levels, there's multiple levels of infrastructure in the bedrock deep below the pyramid. That's where they were found, but there might be as many as a hundred thousand of these things in existence today. So gotcha. there's a lot more like that. And they come, it's not just Saqqara. We find them, the Petri found them in Giza. They, they found been found down in, in, in Southern Egypt uh, in sites that are now underwater. Uh, it's because they put the high dam in and Lake Nasser has flooded a lot of that area. Yeah. Uh, some of these sites were dug up in the 1960s, things like this. So they found sort of all up and down Egypt. But yeah, the, the, big, the big store of them was beneath um, the Step Pyramid. And you uh, were just on a jaw-dropping podcast with Randall Carlson on Danny Jones' show that uh, just dropped a couple of days ago. And I highly mm-hmm. recommend that to, to others. But one of the things you mentioned there that I was unaware of was that the <clears throat> The the vases were found uh, in with a a burial, and that burial would also have crude pottery jars in it, right? Yeah, vases. So they could, yes, uh, this, yeah. yeah. So I I I mean, like, sort of be clear, Alex and Nick and the guys doing the work, the vase scan project and the metrology, they're defining the precision, they're measuring these things. I, I'm like, I'm not specifically part, I'm kind of reporting on the work they're doing. Yeah. And then a lot of what I'm, I do is I, I, I put that into context. Like I'm looking at the overall picture and I have a, my own, I guess, interpretation of what we're looking at because the, the, the vase is really interesting. I, I, I call it like a tale of two industries and I have yeah. a long presentation that, that goes into these details, but this is one of the, the paradoxes that are associated with these types of precision made ancient artifacts is that, they're found in situ and in burials with extremely primitive artifacts and objects that that are very much, you know, you don't need to analyze them to know they're handmade, like handmade mm-hmm. pottery that isn't even spun on a wheel. You know, it's been hand formed with 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 uh, clay or whatever, and then and then fired or um or uh, or dried. Uh, you see a lot of imitation in that pottery as well. So in a lot of cases, you'll see that they've they've painted up uh, these these primitive pottery vessels to look like granite or to 
to look like you know other types of hard stone uh, there's a there's a whole bunch of um different examples of this and it's it's sort of explained in an interesting way in the archaeological record they say well you know these hard stone vases were expensive not everybody could have them but you could you could get the magical properties of them by imitating them in pottery i i'm not sure if that holds a lot of water for me uh personally i i think there's a there's another interesting um explanation for this that, I, that i've seen try to be kind of explained in, in what you might call the the mainstream narrative it's it's that it's I, I saw it with an antiquities dealer he said there's a note on the the vases uh and it said that you know it's really interesting that the only form of sort of advanced stonework that we see from these periods particularly pre-dynastic periods is the stone vases like there's no other evidence of that capability existing right in there's no temple that it's artifacts. associated with where you say well here is a very no. very old temple that also has yeah yeah so it's to me it's i'm looking at it and go okay you have a you have a class of objects and uh, and all these artifacts that very much fit what we would consider the tools and techniques and capabilities of a pre-bronze age and then later bronze age culture in the in the dynastic egyptians uh and then you have a, a category of artifacts that that don't mm -hmm. right that they, they, they exhibit these advanced um uh, signs of manufacturing of, of we're talking very very hard types of stone and precision work and you know we're discovering that there's a lot of mathematics and design behind these things as well to say uh, so I, I look at it as like it's yeah I, I think it's like a tale of two industries you have one you have these category of artifacts that fit the capabilities tools and techniques in the archaeological record of those cultures and then you have the stuff that doesn't and i think a, a very possible explanation for this is is one of inheritance and longer timelines so if you know if, if you are finding these things and if you're in the business of making pottery and vessels you and and you're playing with stones and things you're going to know intrinsically recognize the value and the significance of finding something so well made and, and it would become valuable and it might be an artifact that you would treasure and then imitate and you'd want it buried with you and that indeed seems to be what's happened, like particularly with Joza, who's a very powerful ruler mm -hmm. uh, of the early din dynastic um, period. I mean, he was evidently collecting these from other tombs, other burials. And he's like, I want all of these things to be buried with me. I'm taking all of these to the afterlife. Uh, they're all going to be mine. And that's kind of where they were found today. Uh, I would also say, and maybe it's not a topic we need to get into deeply, mm -hmm. but we, we see this same relationship of primitive relatively primitive artifacts and, and techniques and then a sophisticated category of, of of artifacts and techniques across other categories of artifacts you mm. see it in the stone boxes you see it in columns you see it in statues you see it in slabs and architecture mm. so yeah it's an interesting paradox that exists at, at and in the earliest um period of of, of the history of civilization and the vases are particularly interesting to me because they kind of peter out. So after the third and fourth dynasty, you don't really find, uh, there's only a handful of examples of these precision hardstone vases that are then attributed to later periods. Like remember the Egyptian civilizations, like, like the dynastic civilizations, 3000 years old. So these are the very earliest parts of that civilization. Uh, and they kind of stop after that real early period of the old kingdom. Um, and that's interesting because the, the manufacture of vases, uh, pretty much switches over to alabaster after that, or white calcite, mm -hmm. which is much, much softer than granite or, you know, schist or porphyry or these other types of stones. And, and those alabaster vases are, are quite obviously and visually handmade. Like they don't exhibit the same characteristics of precision and symmetry and balance that you get in the hard stone examples. So that's a real clue. Um, a lot of the other categories of artifacts do get attributed to these later periods of time. So it's kind of a harder argument to make about, well, could these, uh, could these other artifacts, like these columns or statues, could they also have all been inherited? But, you know, because later on in periods, you know, like the, the, the New Kingdom or the, the 19th Dynasty with Ramses and Meren Patar and Seti I, they've all written their name on these things. Therefore, they kind of get attributed to that period of time even though that's also a problematic method of, of dating these things. Cause I mean, there's artifacts with four or five different Pharaoh's names on them. And there's plenty of evidence that shows that, you know, these things have been written on long after they were initially. <clears throat> so what we have here is the mysteries of regular dynastic Egypt, which can keep us busy for the rest of our life. 
but just so people understand, then you're mixing in artifacts from someone who was before the Egyptians that we think of, your Steve Martin Pharaohs, right? Prior to them, some culture existed that was able to make extraordinarily, and this is the important word, precise, to say the very least. And we're going to get deeply into that with um, um, with the gentleman here. Um, and then we don't know when those came. And Ben, I guess you're saying that if the person was pre-dynastic and was buried with crude items and precise items, you're saying the pre-dynastic person, <laughs> who is already a mysterious cat himself, right? But he had he was buried with things that may have preceded him. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. That's yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, and this, it look there's there's a there's all sorts of other avenues of avenues of evidence that point towards this possibility. Cataclysm's obviously a huge piece of this puzzle that unlocks this capability. The younger driest, what happened to us? But you can go from cultural tales you know, origin stories and religions all around the world talking about precursor civilizations that were destroyed and then mankind had to start again. That's a that's almost a constant all around the world. There's there's information in ancient maps and and you know, all of this really interesting evidence that points towards that. I think cataclysm kind of un unlocks that possibility. But I think, yeah, at this point in time, the one probably the best explanation for the evidence we see is that there had, was likely some form of civilization that had significantly advanced capabilities enough to do the work that we're seeing and to have understood the globe and its and its nature because a lot of that stuff's encoded in artifacts yeah. like the pyramids and in ancient maps and i think that explains the the evidence that we see i mean that's my contention at the moment and i do want to separate that from the the vase work that that is the scan project that's happening that alex yeah we're going to switch over to them and just I mean uh, that's yeah. i'm you know i'm like I'm out here on YouTube sort of speculating about this stuff. It's it's a similar line of evidence. I mean, Graham Hancock believes and and is and has contended this as well for for many years. Uh and many other people have also. And I just I just I look at it from the perspective of you know, what's the best explanation for the evidence we see when we're open-minded and and we can, you know, account for all of the Well, evidence. Ben, it it kind uh, of breaks down like we uh, set the cosmic summit up, you know, that you're going to have people that are doing the the objective work and then you're going to have subjective interpreters on the stage right. as well so you got your phds and um, these guys i don't think they got phds but they're certainly well credentialed they're um credentialed objective measurers and then you're more the journalist in this case and reporting right. and interpreting yeah. right and that's a great role yeah. but but people do need to understand that the, these gentlemen are there to tell us the nature of the object, not as much to explain it. Ben would be here to explain it, but Ben, could you pop some pictures up? And then I'd like to um, turn to Alex and Nick and ask them, why are these objects special um, besides their beauty and apparent symmetry? Why are they special? And Ben will let me you see. Know, so, you, so you want me to yeah, share Yeah, some, please. Uh, while while they're kind of, you know, see what they think is uh, and maybe you could frame it in terms of your introduction to them. So I doubt you two were collecting um, pre-dynastic uh, stone carved vases when you're in high school, right? I mean, yeah, this wasn't so, your thing. Um, and then all of a sudden they appear on your radar. Take it from there. Yeah. So the, the accuracy of, you know, these ancient Egyptian structures, some more famous than others, Ramsey statue heads, Obelisks, uh, boxes of the Serapium, et cetera, were pretty common dinner time conversations at my Well, house. they were for you. And, yeah, uh, that's yeah. right. <laughs> and just so people know so, that, that uh, uh, Alex's father is Chris Dunn, who's one of the most prominent authors of uh, and uh, the most prominent uh, ancient high technology advocate and has been for 30 or 40 years. But he came across it as an objective researcher, too. He didn't go woo yeah. and then start doing the math on things, he looked at things and said, the, this is incredible. How can this be? Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I started working in measurement in my early 20s and started interfacing with uh, a structured light scanner at my employer. And it just clicked, it just clicked with me yeah. that this kind of technology is essential, essential to be used on these artifacts and can really be um, 
the the ju- the judge yeah. of all the claims that have been made, you know, Petrie before my dad, yeah. my dad and his, place, and then, you know, what can ultimately come along to provide the data yeah. to solidify their cases. And, um, I was on a tour of Egypt with my dad in 2018 when I met a man named Adam Young and I told him of my vision for scanning. And he had told me that he had a, a collection of uh, Egyptian artifacts and at the time, other than, you know, one brief passage in my dad's book, I hadn't really paid much attention to the vases. Um, and he said he had a collection of these vases. So we said, oh, excellent. So we brought a few down. We checked them out um, and we took the most precise one and got it, got it scanned. And, you know, we knew it was special just from what we saw with our hand tools. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, that very first structured light scan, the data that that brings back and continues to bring back, um, I'll, Nick will definitely get into some of the deeper analysis that Mark Vist has done on that artifact, um, just blew the lid off of everything. And the fact that we have you know th- tens of thousands of these to investigate is such a blessing because we can build a very, very strong data set and start to produce evidence that we've already produced evidence that's irrefutable in the evidence itself. But once we delve into working with museums and getting into um, pieces with real provenance, um, the data will just become too powerful to be ignored. Awesome, man. And, that yeah. is just, that's just the way I look at it too. You, you, it's, it's tough yeah. to refute precision on the level that we're talking now. This isn't like, uh, you know, you would have the only way to refute it is often the case with these technological things is to reproduce it. Reproduce it is, um, uh, has, has not been done and is probably beyond the ken yeah. of man unless we geared up specifically to do this. And, um, y'all can certainly elaborate yeah. on mm-hmm. that, but Nick, mm-hmm. Nick tell, tell them, uh, but, and, and I'm to make the case, okay, both of these gentlemen are credentialed fabricators in a big way. They keep their employer, uh, confidential cause you don't want to mix work and pleasure. But they they know how to operate uh, high tech machinery and tools and analysis equipment. And maybe, uh, Nick, you could give us a little about kind of y'all's general background and skills and how that skill set met the vases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, this was uh, this was an interesting journey because, you know, as as a, uh, a young adult, I really enjoyed shows like Ancient Aliens Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, those, those kinds of, uh, you know, things that you would watch and say, wow, that's crazy. You know, what's going on there? Right. And, uh, you know, I, I went to college, uh, studied to be a manufacturing engineer. So I I have a degree from Purdue in aeronautical engineering technology. And I probably the top school in the country for that, isn't it? (laughs) Damn, uh, it's one, one of them. them. Yeah, I know it's hard to pick tops, but yeah, yeah that's uh, that's a serious <laughs> yeah. education in that field. But please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and so I I learned that, and then the other thing that that came out of that was I also uh, am a licensed aircraft mechanic. Mm-hmm. Um, so hands on, and uh, you know, theory kind of they they were taught hand in hand mm-hmm. on purpose. Um, that's a, a really good way to to get somebody to understand what you're designing and, and, and how that affects, uh, you know, practical implementation. Mm-hmm. So that was, that was my, you know, my schooling. And then I started working for a uh, aircraft manufacturer and, uh, Alex actually hired in mm-hmm. and started working with me. Nice. Um, and one of the first things that Alex, you know, shows me obviously is this, uh, report that he had, from the scan that Adam and him had done on this vase. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that and I said, there's no way. I love it. I was like, no, there's no way. This, this is, this is insane. So I was like, do you have the model? Do you have the scan data? And he's like, yeah. So we threw it in our measurement software and I just started going to town on it. Yeah. I, 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 you know, they had, they had an initial report that had, you know, really just the basic stuff that you would want to look at. And then I just started coming up with, the next thing and the next thing and and just kind of me and him going back and forth like oh man let's look at this let's look at that whoa and we started pulling out all of the dimensions and things that we have in the report that is shared uh, ben show us that jar show us the first scan jar and and nick i'd like you to tell me so Mm -hmm. why were you amazed 
right? You, you, again, well, it's beautiful. It comes back. Yes, it's been measured. Why mm-hmm. do the measurements of anything that looks fairly mundane? I mean, it is classically beautiful mm-hmm. and you can appreciate it given the period and whatnot. But, but, but what mm-hmm. is, what was amazing about it? What couldn't you wrap your brain around? So, yeah. So the biggest thing for me was, uh, it's the one in the before, center. Just so you know, this is the, Oh, great. The Thank you. Yeah. So, so before, before I got into measurement, um, I was actually a CNC programmer on five axis CNC machine tools. And, um, you know, we made, we made tooling, we made parts and all this stuff. Um, so I had experience as a machinist Mm -hmm. and I also have an experience as a, you know, a metrologist. And so the, the first thing that amazed me was the tolerances that were held on this were just, I mean, we were working in composites at that time. This was a different employer than where we're at right now. And they, they were 10, 20 times. Define tolerance kind of for the layman. It's not the typical usage of the term. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in terms of this, like if you're looking at, uh, say like a, a circle, Mm -hmm. the, the tolerance meaning that I'm talking about here is, is basically how circular is Mm -hmm. it? Right. So if you're going to say you have, you have a circle, but it's a little oblong, Mm -hmm. right. You might give that a plus or minus ten thousandths of an inch window to be a little oblong, but it's still a circle, mm-hmm. right? And if it's perfect, then your tolerance is, your tolerance of plus or minus ten thousandths of an mm-hmm. inch. You're dead center in the middle of that tolerance. You have no deviation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when when you look at something like this, um, what becomes really important is seeing the form, the the circularity, the cylindricity, the flatness, the perpendicularity, because those are all things that that come from uh, the manu- manufacturing capabilities mm-hmm. um, and things that generally, I'm, I really honestly don't think that you could do by hand in such a hard material. Yeah. So when he told me this thing is granite, which as metrologists, we're very familiar with <laughs> yeah. granite. Yeah, we're very familiar. <laughs> Because yeah. because granite is very thermally stable. It's very dimensionally stable. Huh. It can be made very flat. We use it for surface inspection plates and our our CMMs, the coordinate measurement machines that we yeah. use to measure things. The base of these is granite. All of the bearing surfaces that the machinery moves on is Why? granite. Why? Because it can be very precisely ground uh. and it holds that shape and form very can you well. get it very very flat extraordinarily flat yeah. and that's yeah. what, uh, and, and you can get anything really flat right yeah. if you rub two things together for a long enough time they're flat what's more interesting is when things are parallel or perpendicular uh-huh. those are things that when you start seeing that you can't just rub two things together and make them uh-huh. parallel uh you know and especially with this vase um, and how parallel are they <laughs> Give me some greatest uh, hits. Yeah. Give me some greatest hits of the well, so Here's here's here's. I, here's, probably... I was going to say here's the certification. I think the for one of the the granite the big granite slab in in at uh, Danville Metal Stamping to give you an idea of how flat these working surfaces are. Right. So this is this is the uh, the quality control kind of the calibrated surface flatness here, which is mm-hmm. what is that less than a thousandth of an inch is how flat yeah, they, to, these tables. To point out on that, those are uh, those are tool room grade granite uh inspection plates so you also have that's a grade b so then you also have a grade a and a grade double a and the lapping that's done on an a or a double a take it takes that down to i think a is somewhere around 40 millionths um and oh, then a double a God. gets down to i mean it's that they are very flat. <laughs> they're very flat because because the tools that we use to do surface and plate layout yeah. re- they rely on that mm-hmm for for what we're doing so you know that's again one of the things that uh when we went to danville metal and we did those those measurements with the rotary table and and used the you know height gauges dial indicators all this kind of stuff um the you know you're you're looking at a reference surface really is what the granite is and um we as people have determined that we're going to lap it down to a flatness of four tenths for the purpose of a tool room grade granite inspection service. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of what that is. How flat? Um, well, really, we're we're talking flat, but how precise? The, what is the relative precision between these items and some of the more precise parts in your day jobs? 
close. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> close. Really close. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, one one thing that will get expanded upon, and I think Ben will do a great job of it, is um, purposeful versus non-purposeful accuracy in artifacts. Mm-hmm. So in any one given piece, any functional piece of an engine, you'll have multiple features, and those features will be assigned different tolerances. Mm-hmm. So certain features have a higher functionality in that system, and they'll have a type of tolerance than features that are purely aesthetic or for a less um, functional purpose. Mm -hmm. So when we speak of the vase, the reason it seems like such a functional artifact is that there are two surfaces in particular that are extremely precise in relationship to one another. And that's the top plane of the vase and the inside mouth opening. So that is the, those are the two surfaces that Nick and I designated as what we call datum surfaces Mm -hmm. to set up our coordinate system, the axis of the piece. Mm -hmm. But other surfaces, you know, other items on the vase aren't terribly precise. Uh, One that gets pointed out all the time is the holes through the lug Mm -hmm. handles aren't drilled in any for any specific purpose that we can see it it honestly kind of looks like they were done way later. Yeah. Um, And Ben speaks to this a lot that it was um, drilled subsequently that it would have been a nub (laughs) <laughs> to coin a phrase in our world, yeah, yeah, a, a, yeah. So, a, a, yeah, a nub, and then they pierced it later. Potentially, I know you don't know, but we're we're here to speculate yeah. at mean, the foxhole. We love speculation in the foxhole. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, because because honestly, when you look at these things, you can visually you can look it down the hole, mm-hmm. and when you do, you'll see the mismatch in the drills, yeah. right mm-hmm. where they stop. And given the fact that they were so accurate in every other aspect of these things, it feels really odd that that's the one place that they just didn't try at all. Do you see that? I I would, I would, sorry. I'd I'd also say that with vases in general, uh, the lugs themselves are really interesting and we'll get in. I'm sure the the guys will get into the analysis on those lug handles, but you, if you look at the broad range of vases, there's, there's many, 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 probably even more, uh, more so than, um, than 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 lug vases with lug handles with holes drilled in them. Many of them don't have holes drilled through them. So, hmm. okay, you know, if you are using that vase as a vase, like, so let's assume for a second that you're inheriting this thing and you you are going to use it as a vase because it's useful as a vase, and you want to put a handle through it or you want to put string through it, then yeah, you might add you might add those holes. But there's there's many many examples of vases, and I'd say probably the majority of them with lug handles don't have those. Interesting. Holes so I, I did not I, know I, that. I think, I think there's a good chance that those, those holes were drilled in a, probably a grinding sort of more primitive fashion later on. And, and then the interior of the vase is not particularly perfect, right? Is, uh, or is it? Uh, <laughs> actually. Oh, actually. It happens. Uh, it's the benefit we, of CT we've scanning. Done little, right? We've done a little yeah. more research on that with CT scanning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, do tell and uh what we've found and we verified this uh uh with uh you know hand tooling hand gauging uh at danville recently is that the wall thickness of these is incredibly yeah. incredibly consistent yeah. yeah which is just odd because if you think that you're going to take one of these and you're going to make it some sort of vase or you're going to make it something to hold say water mm-hmm. right but it's granite this is a very hard material. And even let's take let's take the fact that we see tube drill marks on tons of artifacts in Egypt. Mm-hmm. You might tube drill this thing out and then use that cavity to hold whatever you were going to hold in. Mm-hmm. But why go through the length of actually machining the inside of that vase to a wall, a consistent wall thickness? That that is just I mean, mind Yeah, when it takes you 10 months to make a little rubber duck out of rock like that woman did in Russia. <laughs> what little, yeah, it yeah. had no it had no interior to it and it looked like shit at the end. I mean, how on earth well, and, are the reproducers going to dare say that you can by hand tool the interior of a piece of granite you couldn't get your damn fat finger through? You know, probably some of them. Yep. And and the inside of it is perfect. I mean, how in the hell does someone Yeah, I mean do that? I'll give I'll give you an example that the vase you can see here on the the left of the screen these these the the OG vase the first one all the the work that's been done at least in my content so far is focused on the center one but the one to the left that's a little taller I mean that thing has been analyzed and scanned and there's even some geometric reports on it now 
I mean, the wall thickness of this vase is very thin. Like a lot of the other vases have some heft to them. Like they're 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 precise and they're they're relatively thick. Um, uh, I guess uh, the thickness mm -hmm. is 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 wider. But this one on the left, I mean, you're talking between two and four millimeters uh, wall thickness. So it's very delicate. In fact, it's translucent. If you, if right. you shine a torch in here, the light comes through. Right. It. But I mean, this was one probably one of the most amazing measurements that that we saw happen on the day when 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 I think it was Chris and Alex were measuring uh, the wall thickness. I mean, what was that? It was basically bang on, right? It was within about a thousandth. Yeah, it's uh, like two to three thousandths of can... an inch. So for <clears throat> reference, human hair is two to three thousandths of an inch thick. Yeah. So that's the variance in wall thickness. And can everyone else, just a program note, can I can't see actually the photos now, but can others yeah, see? Yeah, I, I can't, can't either. either. Okay. I can't see what Ben's showing. Yeah. Is this better? Uh, can you see it now? No. Huh. Okay. Well, I mean, I look. I can send these photos over later uh, if we need to add them in. But um, I'm sharing the window. No, no, okay. we, can, we can see now. Oh, oh, that's oh, gone. It's gone. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I stopped. Sharing I didn't even all get a second. Let me. Huh. All right. Let me go back. I'll bring it back up and I'll bring it on this page and hopefully you can see it. I, I find it tremendously helpful. If we Where can't, we can certainly talk our way around it. But so, I, I love the here we go visual aspect. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Now we okay. can see them. So okay, I can't see it, but that's center. fine. As long as, um, let me check with uh, production here. We good, Jamie? Can people see? I mean, oh. Beckett? No. Oh. George? <laughs> okay. Press <a> what? <laughs> I just hung <laughs> up. So hopefully people can see it, but this, yes. So these are, the, the, the original vase is in the center here. The, the How very, do I hang very back in? The walled vase is actually uh, here on the, on the yeah. left of the screen. That and they're frozen? The that I've kind of termed the spinner vase. Um, the shorter round one is is also utterly remarkable, and it's it's on the right. Um, these probably exhibit some of the best aspects of precision that we've seen on any of these things. Uh, did you did you have the picture of me shining the flashlight in that? I do. Yes. Let's let's grab that. Where we're yeah. playing with that, I got to find. I think it. that was a, a really great. Picture yeah, excellent of example of it. Um, man, where is that? Is the trick. That's centering that thing. I'm trying to think when we were doing that. George, you there? Beckett? We lose you guys. It's our Foxhole podcast now. It's ours now. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, let me find it. It's probably more of a video than anything else. Uh, this was, and these are all pictures from the day that we spent out at Danville recently doing inspections on the vases uh here we go i think no this is us moving. thanks fellas i'm back you might not have noticed me gone but <laughs> we, okay. we took over your podcast for a minute there thank George. you very no, much that's the good thing about an informal <laughs> podcast okay. yeah yeah <laughs> trying to i'm trying to find um a little video here of uh i'll tell you what let i me, can see it now i'll stop sharing and let me find it and i'll share it when I'm. yeah take your time yeah, yeah, yeah and um fill in some holes guys um trying to describe the precision of it to people we'll get to the math yeah. in a minute but more kind of just on the relationship between various uh various so geometry of the jar what the big the big thing that we focus on with these vases and you may be able to see this 3d print that we have ah, here, terrific yeah um is pretty much how the geometry relates to the center axis of the piece right so when you're talking about fabricating this you have to not only control all of the geometry about one shared central axis, but then how do you, the big, you know, the next big question is how is that measured and how is that mm -hmm. controlled? So for any, you know, um, to not to discredit or disrespect anyone who can, claims that this can be done by hand um, with the tools of the time. I'll maybe, do that if you need to. I will disrespect yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe they can prove <laughs> how the materials used for removal. But then the question is always going to be lying in the corner. What was their method of verification? Mm -hmm. Because um, how are how are you able to you know be yeah. sure that you're holding these kinds of levels of precision and especially down to one, two, and three thousandths yeah. of an inch? It's it's well. Just... Am I right that that's that's why you need sophisticated point cloud scanners that didn't exist twenty years ago? Yeah. To to even know something is that perfect. So wow. if you were the maker of something that perfect, you don't do it accidentally. You've got to test yourself, yeah. right? Yeah, and we actually see uh, what what we kind of feel like are examples of yeah. uh, uh, learning, 
right? Mm -hmm. these, oh, really? These, we will say all these vases are not as accurate as this one. True. We have found wow. that we feel like there's a correlation between the red, the red granite inaccuracy that the red granite vases seem to be more accurate than the others for whatever reason. Granite in general. Yeah. The granite in general. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. More than the diorite and corundum. Right. The diorite and corundum seem, seem to be a little bit less accurate. Um, and we're, I mean, we really don't know why, but we're just seeing kind of a, a trend and trying to get enough data on enough of them to statistically say, this is a trend. Well, those are harder materials, right? Corundum yeah. is harder than granite, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, corundum is mm -hmm. like a nine on the most scale of hardness. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a good reference. I'll go back in the videos, but, you know, what is like iron's like a five steel, hardened steel, six, six and a half. Granite's in that mm -hmm. six range can be up to seven. Flint's like a seven. Uh, some of the porphyry, a lot of the vases we're talking about are in the sixes and sevens and even eights. And then you get up to some vases with a lot of like corundum in them. And it's, you know, that's a nine on the Moscow diamond being a 10, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the interesting thing about these materials is, is also that, you know, that it's not, they're not homogeneous. So it's granite is made up of a, a number of yep. different materials, quartz, mica, hornblende, you know, silica, and they vary in hardness almost. It's at a that that level. caught my eye when you first started working on this and you showed it in the very first video it, when you showed the white and the black, and those are completely different minerals in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. my God, how in the world can you use almost even a modern tool to remove material consistently between two randomly varying collage of two different materials? I mean, that can't be done. This is this is a really big topic of discussion for us from the manufacturer. I bet it is. Um, yeah. Because, uh, you know, as you saw in that picture that Ben was just showing, the areas that that were you know the light was coming through uh, versus not those were uh, the quartz crystal inclusions right yeah and when you're when you're looking at that doesn't matter if you're I guess you could say machining on the quartz mm -hmm. or the material next to it there's no steps there's no um, difference in that surface that's really discernible and. And uh, you you had said something earlier that uh, was interesting. You know, it, it took the scanners for us to be able to really see this, but in all honesty, it didn't. So the plate layout that we did mm -hmm. with the dial indicators and things like that, right? That was that was really the first thing that Alex had done way back in. Uh, I mean, twenty nineteen. 2019 or late sorry maybe late 2018 yeah um that was the first thing that clued them off onto this and there was a video that um i think adam has yeah it's on it's in the first video with them yeah it's in the first video with them where they take indicator checks. right the indicator checks and they they do the luck handles and all that and uh so you can use basic uh you know technology like that but it has to be the the measurement technology has to be a level uh, an order of magnitude more accurate than what you're you're making, right? Mm -hmm. so in metrology, there's a rule of ten, right? If if mm -hmm. you're going to measure something to say a ten thousandths tolerance, you need a device that is capable of measuring at a thousandths in accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sure that when you measure that, that reading is correct, right? So when you're looking at those kinds of things. Even if they didn't have, you know, uh, computerized technology to measure these or whatever, we are using indicators that are graduations down to half a thousandth, um, you know, or or even even a tenth, uh, ten thousandth of an inch, tenth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to to verify the accuracy on this by hand by by plate layout. So even at that point, it's it's astonishing because, like Alex said, you you don't make something like this accidentally. By just there's no no wasted precision, right? You don't waste precision. Right, precision yeah. has to equate to function, or yeah. you've yeah. wasted yeah. a lot and, of time. And you have to know that you're being precise if you have a function. Right, that's right. the biggest thing, and that's where that's where the the mathematics and the things that Mark uh, has gone into really come into play. Here is 
first of all, yeah, they had to have had some way to know that they had done this right. Because it, it obviously seems to me that this thing was functional in some sort of way other than holding a liquid. Yeah. Um, it, ju- it just, it doesn't feel right to say that they did that for show. Well, yeah. I used to think that maybe that's what it, maybe they had that miraculous process or tool, you know, that is unknown to us and they just did it to show off. Well, right. And if you, yeah, if you got a magic a, wand, why not make the stone jars that you do hold your, you know, liquids in or your wine or your, you know, sheep blood, but go ahead and make it perfect well, because you can, which would be miraculous in itself. But I've mm-hmm. been starting to think, and we'll get more into this. I want to hear what y'all say about that, but um, starting to think that it did have a function, but it was more like a, a cryptological one. Uh, Right. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a couple of points that I like to make when it when, yeah, when it comes to that discussion around precision. And I I did a whole video on precision, and, and there's absolutely a re- relationship between precision yeah. and function. Right. That's is you only develop precision in the pursuit of of function. It, it's very expensive to do so. You know, it's the reason that we we you know we we do semiconductor manufacturing down in you know nanometers whatever. Um, uh, today, it's because you have this, you know, you can fit millions of transistors in a tiny little footprint and it's the power consumption's low. Like there's a cost. You chase that for a particular reason. But once you develop a manufacturing system that delivers precision, right? So this is the reason why our car panels all fit together better than they used to in the 1960s or the toasters that you buy uh, yeah. are, are well made. It's because, you know, these things are designed and then they're executed in a manufacturing system that just by its its nature delivers a degree of precision. So it may not always be needed on the artifact, but you know you see the results of that precision. And I, I think that's a, I think that they were chasing that this precision must have been developed in in pursuit of function. And when I look at the artifacts across ancient Egypt, I look at things like the the precision made stone boxes. These vases, I I suspect had a had a had a functional use what that is i don't know that's complete you know it's speculation uh and i know you were t- saying before the podcast malcolm's got some interesting thoughts on that um but uh you know there's when you look at things like statues it's i you know it's hard to argue that well these statues were functional because some of these statues mm-hmm. in the work that's they haven't been fully scanned and i'd love to you know apply some of the, the technology and the analysis that's going into the vases to other artifacts too but the statues, at least to the eye and to the work that guys like Chris Dunn have done, do show very, very strong indications of this this type of level of precision. And well, that's a and great balance. question, though. But they're not functional, but, right? But but they seem to have been executed uh, by a system and a manufacturing process that delivers precision. But but Ben, help me out with that. We know in Chris Dunn's book, for instance, um, you have Ramesses at Karnak. Isn't that Ramesses? Uh, Luxor, but oh, no. yeah, the statues Luxor, at Karnak Luxor. Too. Yeah. yeah. Luxor, where he does the symmetry of the face right. and double it and cut it in yeah, half the, and all that, and it's absolutely perfect. But 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 tell me that we know that that was obviously a dynastic pharaoh. Well, could they have retained <laughs> some of it? Does that mean they could have made a vase, or did they envisage future <laughs> pharaohs? It's a good they, question, I, and I've had this question, and it's is it's, it a hand me down pharaoh? So, so the uh, question is 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 essentially like, well, if you think the statues are so old, how come they look like dynastic? Egypt Egyptians. I right. actually I actually think it's the other way around. I think that Dina- I I look if you look at the Egyptian this is off tangent we'll come back to the vases and precision but hold it state if, it the other way around. The other way around is that the dynastic Egyptians look like that because they were modeling their culture off their precursors after and the they, perfect in, and they inherited iconography style artifacts and that the whole culture was based off it and in fact if you look at the history of dynastic egypt themselves what they say about their history their lineage that's also what they say holy like they, shit i th- never thought that they the, the the whole the the the, lar- the statues could have been inherited right from some deeper time and then they were playing dress up yeah i mean that look there's there's and- two, or, two or three different sources for the Egyptians themselves calling their own culture a legacy culture. And one, I mean, yeah. they have a list of Kings that goes back nearly 40,000 years. Like yeah. they talk yeah. about other periods of time, Zeptepi, when the gods themselves walked the earth, the, the period after yeah. that, it was like 20,000 years. Then there's the time of the Shemsu Hor, the followers of Horus. This was Kemet. around 15,000 years. Yeah. Kemet. They trace their own history way back. It's only in the, the kind of the Western archeological 
uh, narrative of of that civilization, we kind of arbitrarily cut it off and say, well, no, this is myth and legend, and then this this list of kings is the actual list of kings in that civilization. But that's not how the ancient Egyptians saw it. And if you think about it in that longer context, you include cataclysm, uh, and you think about mm-hmm. okay, so once there's enough people and the and the, the the people in that region congeal into a civilization and they get started, so what if they did inherit artifacts? potentially architecture, but statues, iconography. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's the, the great, the Ozymandias poem, which I, I read in the, mm. in the, the, the last video on, on Luxor Temple. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine coming across the remnant of either broken or still standing, like something like a hundred plus foot statue. It's basically a God of, of this thing that's out there in the, in the desert and you come across it. I mean, this would, would this not sort of inspire you and, and make you think that's a God, I'm going to look like a God. And there's, there's a one of the things I like to point out is that across the whole period, and we, we've kind of lost George again. Um, <laughs> but it's now it's my podcast now. Um, <laughs> um, as you go through the 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 history of of the dynastic Egyptian civilization from the old kingdom to the new kingdom, even into the Ptolemaic times, you the iconography of how pharaohs represent themselves in their burials and in their tombs it's very it's very consistent. They show themselves being amongst the gods. They they take on the persona and the the identity and you know the the, the trappings of gods. They're they're depicted the same ways. Uh, they may I look I think it's entirely possible that they got that iconography and they got that look from things that they might have inherited. And in that context, that's I think it's a reasonable explanation for some of the statues really not being explainable. Um, within the capabilities of the dynastic Egyptians, I mean, just precision and the stonework aside, I, I think it's, I think there's a real problem in the logistical world of, uh, of, of those guys being able to move around so, sort of thousand ton plus single blocks mm-hmm. of stone. And I mean, in some cases you've got like, there's a, the remnants of a thousand ton plus block of uh, okay. a, a statue that, that is up in Tanis in the North. And it's more than a thousand miles from the quarry for that stone. Mm-hmm. You're back, George. Did you hear all of that or? Yes, no, I was. Uh, okay. Fortunately, I was able to hear it. Thank okay. you. For, so that's, yeah. in a nutshell, and in a, a very short summary, that's, that's, I think you can, that's, that's the connection I draw between kind of the iconography of the dynastic Egyptians and the statues. Do you think that, and let me ask again, kind of, uh, uh, did they find any of the um, vases in the Serapium, which is adjacent, but not under Saqqara? Not that I know. No, I don't think okay. so. Okay, but doesn't it seem uh, tempting to link the manufacturer of the boxes with the manufacturer of the vases? Well, And yes. call them contemporaneous? I mean, certainly it seems like you have similar degrees of precision, not that we've really been able to do. I mean, you know, Chris Dunn has been in there with, with very precise sort of hand tools, straight edges and squares. Mm-hmm. And, and shown that that precision, that level of precision seems to exist. And there's other boxes that, that have those characteristics too. I think we were in, in um, Lahoon. That's, that's a remarkable, again, rose granite box, actually, that maybe the, up until the vases, I think, was the most precisely measured thing. Petrie had it down to about four thousandths of an inch and things like this. But, um, you know, you got to also remember the Serapeum was occupied. It was absolutely 100% used by the dynastic Egyptians. They were in there. They renovated the site. They used it. There, there, there may well have been artifacts in there at some point that they, they took. Who knows? But a lot of these other the vases and the caches of them are typically found in, you know, tombs and burials that that weren't raided and, um, and uh, and 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 basically upset at at some point. Or in some cases, they even were raided, but people weren't looking for vases; they were looking for gold or for other things, and they'd break vases and things like that. But yeah, there was a long period of occupation. Like, in the Serapium, the dynastic Egyptians were 100 percent using that site. There was a priesthood that, that ran it for um for, for you know a just long time. one of my curiosities. You know, uh, haven't been to the Serapium, and it's all amazing. But just one of the things that just sticks with me is the damn scoop marks. You've got this precision, you know, gigantic, tremendously heavy object, and then they're just random divots out of the damn thing, right? Ben, am I remembering yes. correctly that no, some of the are. boxes, and it's they're not, not the kind of thing that you get when you bump it against the wall. It's not the kind no. of thing that happens when you drop a bowling ball on it. 
it, no, it, what they were doing there, and and I can send you some pictures or I'll pull some up of the Serapium. If yeah. Like, but um, look, those those are it's it's an interesting thing, and I think it's a hint towards the functionality of uh, of the boxes. Is that it seemed to be very important to the builders, or whoever made them, that these boxes were solid, just solid. Mm -hmm. They were able to withstand force i mean vibration mm -hmm. something right they, they they were they were meant to withstand force so what you're seeing with those scoops that was deliberate because they're they're actually removing imperfections and cracks in the stone so mm -hmm. in, in fact you can see this process because the serapium is super interesting mm. because you have unfinished boxes uh where you can see them in the different stages of manufacturing and finishing uh in the in the site itself but what they would do if there's a crack in the in the stone, they they would empty that crack out. So if you think of it like a crack through, they're basically gonna empty that crack out so it can't continue. Um, I the same did not sort of know, thing so, happens yeah. with the aircraft. I mean, I'm sure Nick can talk about it, like how they deal with cracks. But what they were trying to do is was, was just empty those cracks out so that they wouldn't continue and, and crack through the the stone. Which, you know, if these things are a one time use box where you're gonna throw in a couple of bull carcasses and slap the lid on it. Who cares? Yeah. It's got a crack. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not doing anything. Yeah. It doesn't really matter if it's got small cracks in it. But but they went to tremendous, tremendous effort to to remove these cracks and imperfections so that the box was solid. And not only that, I mean, they polished this stone up. It's one of the real mysteries in the Serapium is how they got to that mirror finish that you see. That's where right. the stone's and reflecting light. And, you know, that's much more easy. It, it's to do also flat polished surface. in the divots. The divots are that's, also polished. See, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was saying. saying. It's like the tool that you did the divot. It, 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 someone had to use a tool to do the divot. For sure. It's not, it, it, yeah, it's not a break. And then the tool that you would need to do the divot would be another one of these tools that we don't know what the hell it could possibly be. I, I don't know how they... Because you're the leaving material. it mirror glass finish. You're both removing... Well, the, yeah. pr the polishing process was probably separate to the the shaping process. Okay. Right? So, and then you would go polish it up. So yeah. let's, let's not, so the way that the polish is, is explained and it's, an, it's yeah. a good point to make is that this is one of those, the devil's in the details and you dig down a little, a little deeper in some of the orthodox kind of mainstream explanations mm -hmm. for this, where, where they, where it kind of falls apart. They say that, you know, they polish stone using sand and water and rocks, right? So you, you get sand and water and you rub it, you rub stones on it and uh, eventually you get it polished. Now that's, potentially possible on a flat surface it becomes mm -hmm. incredibly more difficult when you're talking about concave or non-flat surfaces to to use that me method to, to polish up stone uh for that matter we see that sort of polish on some of these statues that are made of things like diorite which is so whoever was polishing these things they were certainly able to do it on non-flat surfaces it, it 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 happens but that technique of using sand and sand and rocks and water and just rubbing on it um it doesn't really explain where we see the polishing there's there's another point that i recently sort of figured out in my own head about this which is which i think is fairly interesting too and and yet another kind of paradox in this whole um this whole discussion is that they say that well they use sand and rocks to polish stone they also say that they use sand and rocks to cut stone Right, so they, and they're saying, well, the, you know, if you use sand and rocks and you grind on it long enough, it's going to leave the types of, you know, spiral grooves and 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 striations mm -hmm. that we see on saw cut marks. And I'm like, well, okay, which one? Which one is this? Which <laughs> what do you either get a polished surface, or do you get something right. that leaves these tool marks on it because you're rubbing on it with sand and rocks or copper bars or whatever? It's like yeah, right. it doesn't make sense. And and just out of interest, the people that have actually tried to do it, and Chris Dunn is one of them, where where they've taken a, a copper <clears throat> tube and sand or some sort of cutting compound and they've they've you know cut or ground out a, a cylinder of of granite <laughs> or something like that it does leave a fairly polished surface you don't get deep striations you don't get the deep sort of tool marks that we mm -hmm. see on some of the examples like petri's core number seven it's another discussion but you know you i just look at it and go well we're kind of getting the same explanation for two, two different processes here one for cutting that apparently leaves these deep striations and grooves and then the same technique is is kind of used to explain how they polish rocks it's like well okay which one is it you know ben um take us to um is it mark vist in denmark mark. who is a mathematician or perhaps a cryptographer mm -hmm. and how did you get in touch and what did he add to the uh growing body of knowledge well i mean i 
I have a, a, a video that dives into it and I'd very much encourage people to go to Mark's website, yeah. which is unsigned.io. And the article is called Abstractions in Granite. Uh, you can just mm -hmm. search for unsigned, unsigned IO Abstractions in Granite. You'll find it. The link's also on my videos. And I'll let, I'll let, I know Nick's got things to say about what Mark did, but I, I am very grateful to Adam and the team for, for allowing us to open source the Vase model, because that's the only reason that, that we've got to this sort of additional analysis from experts like that. Um, and the work that Mark's done, right? That it came out of the, from the process of open sourcing these results and, and basically getting interested people involved. And that's what happened with Mark. Mark took the model, you know, he, he started to analyze it. He wrote an initial um, article about it. And then, you know, he's just, he's a, I mean, just a genius in terms of his ability to, to reverse engineer the vase. It's essentially what he's done. And he's revealed the mathematics and the design behind it. And not only that, but the the implications of what he found is just it's truly remarkable. I have you know, it's 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 hard to to really overstate what what he's found uh as a result of this analysis on the vase. It has ties into sacred geometry. Uh there's a complex uh system of mathematics that that is behind it. There are all of the curvatures and surfaces on the vase are related to each other mathematically. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really mind blowing what he's found. I don't know, Nick. You probably uh, can explain this um, better than I can right now. And I know there's, there's some aspects of that you want to talk about. But look, Mark's Mark's analysis has just revealed the depth of complexity and sophistication. I think that's behind these, and then what that potentially means in terms of how it was designed, and then that design tran was transferred to a manufacturing system. It's we're, we're now leagues beyond this idea that there were people banging on these things with rocks and sand and sticks, right? Because let's not forget, that is that is how they're explained. Okay, um, so again, today. it's kind of the, the first step of y'all's investigation reveals precision. Yeah. That's published yep. and publicized by you, Ben, yep. right? Gentleman in Denmark who has special skills, and I love this stuff. These stories happen all the time, and they're going to define knowledge in the future. But somebody pops up, genius pops up in Denmark and says, hey, I find math in the geometry of the objects that I, I can go derive from it um, geometrical um, understandings. For instance, the flower of life. Tell, you, tell us how we get to the flower of life and how that is represented in the object. You want to give it a shot, Nick? Yeah, so this is, this is I could probably talk for a couple hours about this. But, I love uh, it, man. But the the first thing that I want to say is this was truly incredible when when uh, Mark did this and I first talked to him about it um, because our software, metrology software, is designed to do inspection the way that we think about creating things. All right. So we work in millimeters. We work in inches. We design things by, you know, uh, fractions, uh, integers, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, but I have not seen a design on an engineering print that specifies a multiple or fraction of pi as a requirement for a part. It's mm -hmm. not how we design and think. So our metrology software is not designed in that way, right? So we don't see relationships like that. And Mark comes in and does the initial analysis. Um, so he actually has two write-ups. And the initial one, um, he basically went through and found... Um, uh, I, this is, this is hard, to, hard to unravel easily. He found a lot of relationships... Um, between the geometric features on here that uh, are really more related to triangles and, and things of that nature, right? Um, but the interesting thing is that he was able to, um, and let me let me see here. I think I can share the screen. Yeah, I was about let to. Let me see. Yeah. Yep. Screen. Take it down, take it down. Let me share this, right? So this is this was the first thing that you know in the initial one, um, 
the initial write up just come This out. is Mark. This is your volunteer out of nowhere. Yes, this, this is, is his work. This, this is yeah. his article and this is what he published about his findings. And this was the initial thing that he found. Um which obviously is just incredible. Um so I'm going to I'm going to not talk so much about this because it gets more interesting. Um so obviously go where I, you want to go, man. I wanted to show this because this was his surface level. This mm -hmm. was him coming through and fitting just simple geometric shapes, the inner sphere, the mm -hmm. outer sphere, which we know have a very good relationship because the wall thickness is extremely consistent. Oh, um, excuse me. One would be built off the inner surface and one yes. is built off the, the edge, outer surface. the outer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then he goes through, creates a toroidal feature on the lug handles, which is the geometry that that would be, um, you know, and he's, he's showing these, these screenshots to show just how accurately these features fit on this vase. And then he Jesus. starts constructing geometry that intersects with the different features. Yeah. So this is where, you know, I, I could go through this a little more, but generally the, this is what he finds. All of these intersecting geometries um, create this. So then he went. Okay, let me through. let me play devil's advocate. Yeah, can it be that if you do something that is beautiful to the eye, it just happens to result in because it is symmetrical, you can build geometrical it can. models when is it, or do you have right. to know geometry? You know, that's getting to the question: Do you have to know? advanced geometry to be able to manufacture it or could it be a, a, a feature of it so i think the important distinction there is you can you can make something look appealing to the eye but the level of of precision doesn't have to be there for that right mm -hmm. that's that's the interesting part um so yeah, you can make something symmetric, you can make something look nice and spherical, but generally if you if you don't use a method of manufacture that allows for that to happen, it comes out either you have to be very very skilled or you have to have a way to verify what you've done mm -hmm. in symmetric um or you have, you know, a machine that does it by its nature. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a, a uh, just a general statement to make, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in terms of that, you, you get to this. So this wow. is the second write-up that he did. Wow. And this flower of life pattern um, actually yeah. occurs a couple times in the vase. <laughs> so this is, this is going to get a little bit deep in the mathematics, right? Go so for it, man. We're in the foxhole. This. We're in the foxhole. So we're, <laughs> he gets into this, but one of the things that he mentions here is um, the use of radians. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in a circle, uh, there are two pi radians. Uh, so for example, 180 degrees would be uh, pi radians. Um, so that's just, it's a, it's a base unit of measurement really is what it is. Yeah. You take the radius, so, you take the radius, the length of the radius of the circle, you apply it to the circumference of the circle. And if you sort right. of think of that as a slice of pie that you cut out of it, the angle that it forms in the center is a one. Yeah. That's one radian, right? So if you stretch that all around, it's, you know, pi radians and for half a circle, a full circle, two pi radians. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is where it gets crazy, right? So you, you, you got this pattern, which is formed by, multiples of of what he he has called here the uh radial traverse <clears throat> pattern okay so mm -hmm. he's defined a function for this um and i actually i've i've talked to him about this a little bit and went through and i actually verified this with the measurements that he did um so what you have here is a grid of flower of life patterns mm -hmm. on top of each other that are based off of uh two different uh traversals of the of this this circular pattern r3 and r4 
And we're going to get into get into a little bit more math down here. And so the way that he did this was he took a uh, the R3 circle in the middle, created this pattern, found the intersection points, constructed, you know, this circle. And of course, you know, you, you have to remember the flower of life intersects with different things on this vase mm -hmm. in multiple places. So we get to this point where you can compare the R3 and the R4 triangle at that intersection point. Mm -hmm. And you get, uh, you get a set of triangles that have adjacent legs that, um, that you can use to form a scalar relationship here, right? So this is where this gets really crazy. And this is, this is, this is just for the circles, all right? So when you do this, you get this, this equation, right? And you solve for this. And you find out that uh, R of N is equal to root six over two to the nth power. Mm -hmm. So this is this is visualized here. But one thing I want to make really clear about this is if I was going to take an equation for a circle, right? That that's not anything phenomenal. And I was going to make scalar multiples of that circle. I wanted to make it bigger by a certain amount, I mean, normally we would just say, okay, times it by two, times it by three, right? Mm -hmm. You've taken a radius or you take the diameter and you multiply it by an integer. Well, instead of that, what he found is every circular feature, except a few very specific ones on this vase, mm -hmm. are multiples in this scalar function. But what this means is not root six over two times two, it's root six over two times root six over two. And then if you go to an R, that would be R2. R3 would be root six over two times root six over two times root six over two. They are scaling this using an exponential function mm. in every circle that's on this vase. Mm. This is just, why? Why would you do mm. that? Well, you, you would at least think you to come up with the wheel by them, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, exactly. anybody that can do that should know to put a round thing on a post and it'll, I mean. Exactly. <laughs> so this, this again, he goes through and, and he maps these circular features. Every single one of these circular features that is on this yeah. base is a product of that equation at some power of, uh, integer of that power equation. holy fuck every single one of them except for a few specific ones all right and they so, get down to two millimeters y'all were saying on danny's show right yeah I think yeah so 1.1 so, millimeter is the smallest radii of the uh, circle uh, try drawing that if anyone want, is interested like try to yeah draw right so, he does he does actually make a point on here that if you wanted to draw that right now uh with a, a drafting the finest drafting pencil that you can mm -hmm. Um, you would have to scale that drawing up by some ridiculous amount to be able to Just draw it accurately enough. Because well, the that. line is the line is wider than your tolerance. Yes. The little bits of graphite from the pencil yeah. would, would disturb. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. You, you have to have fucking computers to do that shit, man. <laughs> this is right. Th this is the conclusion that he does come to in this article. Um, and and I try to stay unbiased but open on this, right? Yeah, you know, man. I'm looking at this through the lens of what, what, you know, we do on our daily basis and this level of, of accuracy and measurement is not done by anything but a computer, um, it, it, you know. And it's just, I'd say to George, to your point earlier about, look, you, you can, in objects, we know things like phi and the golden ratio appear, it appears in nature, yeah. it appears in aesthetically pleasing things. But yeah. when you when you're looking at at what is represented here, which is twelve degrees of mathematical interrelationships, so all of these curvatures being based on on a single equation, as as you know, they're, they're the scalar function that they're, they're all represented by it, like they're, they're deliberately chosen um, because they fit this pattern or whatever whatever base units they were working in. That's it's 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 quite impossible to suggest that that's accidental. So yeah. 
you know, yeah. the, the conclusion here is that this artifact wasn't eyeballed or just made by some dude that was like trying to make a vase. This thing mm-hmm. was designed like it's 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 kind of an inescapable conclusion, at least for me, that this has to have been designed and likely mathematically designed and and <clears throat> based on okay. geometric principles. Okay, this is the first vase, and of course, y'all. This is one of the kind of interesting, you know, takes on this is that y'all could have gotten very, very lucky and happened to uh, get the very first <laughs> vase to ever be scanned. Happened to represent. No, such man, a, we made it in the shop. Remember? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Y'all yeah, made yeah. it to. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the, yeah. You're pulling we one on. We did this, we did this ourselves. Went back uh, in time and made it in the 1980s and just planted it. Yeah, well, that's yeah. what people say. I collect old maps and people say, you know, oh, somebody could fake that. I'm like, if they faked it, you know, they deserve 500 bucks, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's just hard to fake some things. Right. Um, so, so there's another, there's another level to this. Yeah. If, 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 uh, if you're ready for me to get, get into yeah, that. Yeah, go ahead, man. Definitely. If you, if you're into it, do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the one radiant arc is yeah. used to construct this cone on the top of this which is just insane because again, when you think about this stuff, radians, pi, these relationships, the, the trigonometry and all that stuff, that that's absolutely out of the realm of what they were supposed to have mathematically speaking. Right. Um, so, Hell, and don't forget, folks, we're talking pre dying We don't even know who these people were. Right. <laughs> I mean, we didn't, we didn't attribute that to the Egyptians. Uh, and whoever in the hell these people were preceded the pharaohs. Yeah. Well, and, and let's yeah. not forget old kingdom Egypt, no use of the wheel, right? There's no evidence for yeah. it. They didn't use the wheel. It was a later invention in later periods of, of Egypt. And then before them, they were pulling this off at some unknown time. Apparently. Mm. So, so this is the next step that, that we go down further into uh, yeah. the, the insanity here. So we take the outside diameter of the vase lip Mm -hmm. and we take the inside radius of the vase lip and we compare those and the ratio there is pi Mm. um, within uh, 0.1% certainty of uh, show us again, the ratio of the outside and the inside. Yeah. So, so the red diameter, right? Mm -hmm. The diameter of the outside. Mm-hmm. And then the blue is the radius of the inside lip. Uh, and uh. that's that's here. Can you guys still see what I'm... Yep. Yeah, so that's the inside cylinder and then the outside lip, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the relationship between those two is pi. Uh, that, so 3.16 sure, times, that but is that does that mean that little line in the radius, 3.16 times it is the length of the diameter? Ratio. So, so actually, so the, here you can see the diameter yeah. divided by the radius, just, yeah. just purely is pi. is pi. Got it. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> so on top of to, that, all right. So how many it, digits it, it, did it, it come out? It doesn't. How many, point zero so, so, yeah. Uh huh. You're point one percent of yeah. delta point from one. pi. Got it. So, um, so again, this. So what he is talking about here is that um, that it equates to a real world deviation of approximately thirty two micron mm. away from what a perfect representation of pi would have been. <clears throat> If they if they made this perfectly to make that ratio pi exactly, they would have only had to to change what they manufactured by thirty two micron. Shit, it's probably the deviation is probably attributed just the the flux of the density of the material after oh, yeah, ten thousand years. It's no, know what I mean? on that lip as well, yeah, it's and in multiple places. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. So okay, so it goes deeper though. Yeah, man. Hold on. <laughs> go down We're the hole. We're going to get there. Here we go. So this is where we find the golden ratio. We start seeing phi show up, mm-hmm. right? So if you look at the diameter of the uh, the neck at that that uh, radial point there, yeah. compared to the radius of the inside again, you get phi squared, the golden ratio squared, with Holy an shit. uncertainty of 0.07%. Mm. Um, so, uh, mathematically speaking, again, 
that's only 20 micron deviation from uh, the mm. perfect representation of phi squared um, in that relationship. And then you go down to the bottom where mm -hmm. you have the uh, diameter <laughs> of the bottom lip mm -hmm. related to the diameter of the top lip. Mm -hmm. So now you're talking about the diameter of this related to the <laughs> diameter of that all the way on the other end of the vase all the way on the other end of the vase mm. is again phi squared and the deviation in that relationship from perfect relationship is 35 micron so th this i just i mean from my perspective in manufacturing when you design something like this, you do it with intent, mm -hmm. right? We don't just design engine parts for airplanes because it looks nice. We design it with an intent and a function again. And generally, because of that, you have relationships between features. You have relationships between an airfoil and and the the size of uh, the place that's going to attach to the the engine and, and all this different stuff, right? Depending mm -hmm. on the loads that are going to be on it, the airflow that's going to be around it, all this stuff, right? You design the function into it. And this kind of stuff feels really, really intentfully designed, especially when you get to this point. Well, this think about it. We, we, we don't, I can't, uh, have y'all thought of any examples where we have, um, developed something with such precision without a function, you know, where aesthetically we were interested, ah, oh, we want this to be perfect or whatnot. Um, and, uh, and we did it just again, almost like you were just showing off and wanting to use your tools would be the only reason you could possibly want to do it without having a specific person, um, a, 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 a specific purpose or, or, its purpose isn't functional like it's a tool, but its purpose is to communicate something. And yeah, that, so, that math was intended to communicate something to us. Talk right. about that, sir. Yeah, we, so we've talked about that a little bit. I know Ben Ben's mentioned that I, I talked to him about that at one point. <laughs> um, and so I, I have another point to make really quick about what you oh, said, please. though. Is that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can see precision in plenty of things that we make for just visual display things right mm -hmm. but the relationships aren't there mm, right? that's the i got thing. you yeah you you're seeing relationships here that yeah. don't just come out of of designing something that's you know visually pleasing yeah. you could make this visually pleasing in a million different ways, right? But right, but you don't have to communicate phi by the ratio of the bottom to the right. top. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where this this all comes together. And Mark makes a really good point here: is when you're looking at this, you're looking at again, kind of a communication mm -hmm. of of information of knowledge. Okay, mm -hmm. so whether or not it was intentional. So mm -hmm. I, you know, in the same way that we, you know, we sent out the Voyager probe in, in, in right. intent to right. tell people that we had knowledge. If they, if they came to earth and human civilization was gone mm -hmm. and there was an aircraft engine sitting somewhere and mm -hmm. they started taking it apart and they looked at it, they would be able to tell, Oh, like these guys were smart. They, they had advanced manufacturing. They, they knew how to design mm -hmm. things. They knew how things worked and they had principles of, you know, airflow, uh, you know, uh, thermodynamics. There's all, all this kind of stuff, right? Just by looking at what we had produced and whether or not this was intended to say, hey, look, we know all these things by its nature in, in production. It probably just is. It's going to tell us that, right? Hmm. Um, it's kind of like reverse engineering. You you learn things from reverse engineering about how something works, um, whether or not the intent was to tell somebody how it works through its design. Um, but but you could look at it. Uh, you say the fellow that did this vest is a cryptographer. Yeah, which is an yeah <laughs> uh, interesting yeah. business line. Anyway, I wouldn't yeah. think that you know probably not a 
too I don't know, but that what what a thing to be. So yeah. he's a cryptographer. So he was given a code and it may reach back twelve thousand eight hundred years and that code has not been deciphered, but now he has deciphered it. So the communication has been completed, right? Yeah, and actually there's even more to this at this point too that I want to make a really big point about. Um, Go right ahead. All those relationships are great. That's that's incredible, right? That's mind-blowing by itself. Now, his next step was establishing that there is a um, essentially a base unit that this was designed in. So uh -huh. this, this, uh, what I'm displaying right now, yeah, uh, kind of walks you through this. And essentially what this means is, um, the, the base unit is, uh, essentially 18.7339 millimeters. Um, hmm. but 1873, that's a secret yeah. geometry number, isn't it? Mm, not Doesn't sure. that pop up? I think, yeah, I'll look no. into that, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, so essentially, um, this unit is the, uh, the, I think the radius of the inside, uh, mouth. Um, yeah. So you can use that unit 18.739 to describe, uh, all of the other dimensions on this vase. Now, this is really interesting. Follow me here, please. Damn right it is. Yeah. <laughs> you could you could make multiples of whatever unit you wanted, right? You you could say the unit was three point two seven eight, right? Yeah. And you could take any dimension on this vase, divide it by, multiply whatever you want, and come up with a number and say, "Oh, that was the base unit," right? Mm -hmm. You you can do that. What is interesting about this is when he uses that unit for the base value, the the one U as he calls it, you see pi numbers of U and phi squared numbers of U and pi over phi squared numbers of U coming from the dimensions on this face. So this is a whole nother layer. It this is isn't wrong. even... This isn't even, hey, there's a relationship between this and this, and it's it's phi squared, or this and this, and it's pi. It's if you figure out that there's a base unit here, you can see that there's the max lip diameter is pi base units. <laughs> the minimum neck <laughs> diameter is phi squared base units. And the base unit coincidentally lines up with the wavelength of uh an electromagnetic wave propagating through a vacuum mm -hmm. uh uh for uh 16 gigahertz mm -hmm. and interestingly enough that is uh i believe if i remember right that's in the microwave range and we use it for satellite communication good god <laughs> you know when, when when these guys made these things and let's say it was to communicate they must have been just chuckling saying boy it's going to blow some son of a bitch's head you know and 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 literally, they were probably thinking they're going to forget it. They're going to rediscover it because we gave them this. We made this communication, and whoever those first cats are, they go and decode it. Are going to be like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, and I mean, and that happened. And y'all are those guys. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, mean, it's I, communicating I, to you across <laughs> the millennia, and y'all caught the ball. I literally, I'm not joking. I almost had a nervous breakdown when I read <laughs> Mark's yeah article here. I would, yeah. I would, I was losing it because I was just like, this is the, to me, this indicates a level of design. There's, there yeah. was intent in the design. Right. I, and that can mm. be, that can be argued. Um, that's a personal belief that I have. Mm. The accuracy and the precision are objective, unbiased measurements. Mm -hmm. But when you get into this, which is mathematics, I mean, this is, you can go through and you can use that model and you can derive all of these from it. And it's all there. And whether or not you feel like it's relevant, I guess, is really the question. But from an engineering standpoint, it feels really relevant. Um, the other thing that he did was show that the placement of the handles is uh, very... Um, 
deliberate. Deliberate. It's based on the it's it's using the one radian arc again. Yes. Uh, to derive the placement of the handles. That's yeah. It. But then how, why does it end up looking like something that would be functional that would be sitting in your kitchen? <laughs> right. I mean, that's... you know, it, 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 you wouldn't think you think that whatever they carved that represent the math, you look at and say, well, that's pretty, but it wouldn't jump to you. Like if anyone else saw that and had no background, they said, well, that's a jar. Yeah, right. That's a jar. But, but, but... but why does math result in something or are they just saying, let's try to make a jar with extraordinary math? Well, I have tons of jars in my kitchen and maybe one or two look like this and plenty of others don't. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the, the interesting thing about, about that is um, like I, and to tie it in kind of with what Ben was talking about is, you, you know, you go back in history, somebody finds one of these, they're like, man, this would be great to hold water with. And then all of a sudden you have a, a vessel of mm -hmm. something that looks like a, what we call a vase or whatever that's been passed down through history that the people said, Hey, we hold water in this. That's what holding water looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what we're going to make to hold water now, because that's kind of what everybody was doing. And that's just what it was. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you, you any thoughts go, there, Ben? What, uh, <laughs> I mean, I agree with what Nick's saying, and it's look, it's I just I, I want to kind of reinforce that that, and and Mark puts it really well in this article, is that this isn't accidental. Like this is when you get, and I I go back to kind of that radial traversal function where you have all of the curvatures on this vase, you know, matching this particular equation. So if you had curvatures of circles that that didn't, you know, were of different radii than the ones that are there, they wouldn't fit this pattern. So you have this mm -hmm. these twelve degrees of stacked kind of interrelationships between these curvatures that all match, you know, this this particular mathematical function that that has these you know base units that Nick was talking about. That's you know, as Mark says in the article, it would be far more likely for you to wake up one morning and have an entirely new quantum universe sprouting out of your left nostril than it would <laughs> than it would for this to be accidental. Mm -hmm. Like it's just it's completely implausible. To, to think that this type of thing is, is, is purely an accident, a function. And, you know, Mark demonstrates this in, in another part of his work where he, he took that radial traversal function, that, that one algorithm, and he, he created a vase based on it. So he modeled it. He said, I'm going to use this, this, this algorithm. I'm going to create a, a model purely from the maths, and then mm -hmm. I'm going to compare that model to the actual scan of the vase. And I think when he did that, the the median radial deviation in terms of the deviation between the, the radii of these circles on his model and the, uh, the, yeah. the actual vase model itself was something like six, six micron, six, six Newton meters or something like. Mm -hmm. I think it was about, if I remember right, it was like something on the order of like 63 micron. Yeah. 63 micron. So that's the radial deviation between the actual <laughs> vase itself and the, and the, ma and the purely mathematical model. So and and, it, and I want to point out very specifically that he designed that parametrically, right? Also, which is is a very big point that he didn't just go in and, and model stuff based off of the numbers. He used the the values, the base units, the yep. the relationships, and he parametrically designed everything from that based on that that base unit, that value, that multiples of those things. He was able to make a CAD model using parameterized values. Are you saying that if someone just handed in that math, all of that gobbledygook I'm looking at now, if somebody just handed you that, could you derive the vase from it? That's what he did. Yeah, That's, That's what, he, what did. he did. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Without any, could he give it to someone who knows nothing about this, that, but is equally skilled with mathematics in the appropriate you know, disciplines, but he gives it to someone who knows nothing about Egypt, nothing about this, just given the math. Yeah. Would that person go and say, well, this describes this shape and it looks like a jar. It, so there's, there's another level of information that would need to be conveyed, but yes. I mean, and, yeah. And I think he, make, he, he makes his numbers available too. If you want to do what he yeah. did, you, it's, it's all available. And yeah, you know, he and, did it in open again. Yeah, and and let's not forget that 
Well, academics sucks. around the world are snapping their laptops shut right now. Maybe, yeah. But you know, <laughs> yeah. Let's not forget that, that you have this sort of perfect mathematical model of the vase. Somebody then executed that design. Yeah. In and 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 hit it with this just utter precision. Like that's it, the the other implication. I'm sure Nick will get to here is that this not so you you have this design behind it. It's got this complex mathematical basis uh, with a base unit that Mark derived. Uh, that you know employs kind of sacred geometry or just geometric features like pi and phi are included, but then somebody executed that design. Somehow that design was transferred to a manufacturing process that was able to execute that design with just this utter precision that we we're seeing. Then this is where you tie back in kind of the precision measurements on it. Like that's remarkable, and that takes you know a degree of of manufacturing and capability that is certainly possible for us to do today, but only with kind of our very best machinery and, you know, computer guided everything. Um, mm. th there's a whole other step involved in there of, of how do you get that design into an output, right? And this is where, you know, I, I mm -hmm. got a lot of flack for, for the video title that I chose, but I did it deliberately, which is were ancient computers used to design this artifact? Because once you get to the point where, which Nick is at, where this thing has been deliberately designed, and it's got this sort of mathematical basis for the design. You you have to be able to somehow transfer that to to output. Like mm -hmm. you know, even if even if you did it on paper, as we talked about, you, because of the yeah. this, this the t minute details of this, you'd have to scale the drawing up, and you could probably draw it accurately mm -hmm. if there's you know a piece of paper the size of the room you're sitting in or whatever. You still have mm -hmm. to then scale that thing down and execute it in the the size that it is, which you know Nick shows with with the model of the vase. It's it's. Mark calls it decidedly petite, which it is. It's like six inches mm -hmm. tall. There's a process involved in going from design to actual output. And mm -hmm. the only way that we know how to do that, and this is what the conclusion Mark's come to, Mark comes to in this article, the only way that we can do that is with something called a, you know, a Turing machine, which is essentially mm -hmm. computers. That's we call them computers, but the, it might have been pneumatic or hydraulic or anyone, you know, there's a few different mm -hmm. ways to do that, but we do it electronically and that's the only phenomena on the planet. The only mechanism that we know that is capable of doing that is a, is a Turing machine. So, yeah. That is I think the interesting, the way that Mark phrased that was uh, he doesn't know of any human alive that can take an input of a mathematical function and then output uh, a physical. But a computer can. But a computer yeah. can. Yeah. Like a lathe operating output or something. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, are we ready to go a little bit deeper in the hole, gentlemen? <laughs> okay. <Sure. clears throat> and then we'll retire for the evening and go piece our craniums back together. Okay. But so um, I'm not an expert on math. I'm not an expert in internal combustion engines. I'm not an expert in physics. I will play like a fake geologist and I'll play fake ancient historian, but, but, um, these other things, I, I don't dare, you know, um, fake, but I've gotten wrapped up in, if I didn't have enough going on with the ancient history stuff, um, some of y'all know, I know the f f folks on the call now that I've gotten wrapped up with, um, a, uh, energy device that has been announced by Randall Carlson and then detail provided by the inventor himself, Malcolm Bendall. <clears throat> and as I mentioned to y'all before the call, um, I asked Malcolm and I guess I, should I give some backstory on this guy? Uh, maybe I'm catching some people cold, but he, he went, I went down to Joe Rogan uh, with him and Randall so that Randall and Malcolm could appear on Rogan at Rogan's request after Randall had said last fall that he'd like to meet the inventor that, uh, excuse me, after uh, Joe said he would like to meet the inventor that Randall was describing on an earlier podcast. So Randall comes back, brings the inventor, and we had a four day wild, wild road trip, man, where I went and picked up Randall, the inventor, Brad, and uh, Stevie T, Stevie actually drove and we got a big old Cadillac uh, Escalade and left Atlanta and spent uh, four or five days on the road and went and saw some Indian mounds and all of this. But long story short, we uh, they went and recorded a three hour Rogan and I sat out in the green room. And as many people probably know, it never showed. So I call it the no show Joe show. 
<laughs> right? So it, it, it just never manifested. And um, I don't blame Joe Rogan one bit. He could have, uh, their commercial implications to this invention, and it would require investment. And he could have walked off that podcast, the inventor, and the next day said, as endorsed by Joe Rogan, please buy my stock offering, you know, and then a bunch of people get, you know, shafted and, and Joe looks like a schmuck for bringing him on. So I don't blame him. And there's no way you're going to truth the stuff in three hours or any number of hours, unless you actually have the machine in hand. And, uh, so we went down, filmed the no show Joe show, and I stayed in really good touch with the inventor. It was kind of funny. I'm not much of a phone talker. And you usually after an intense four or five day man trip, you know, you don't hear from the guy the next day. You know, because you're all exhausted and sick of everybody and whatnot. Nah, next day, right after we get back from Texas, Malcolm calls me. And then he calls me the next day. And he calls me the next day. And I was like, I ain't much of a phone talker, but this this gentleman is interesting. He's kind of intense, but I, I really like him. And so I stayed in good touch with him. And long story short, we went out to Albuquerque, New Mexico and demonstrated the machine to a Tesla tech conference, which is kind of like the seventies called and they want their conference back. You know, (laughs) I mean, the thing was stuck in, you know, somebody's sponsoring a a, a conference. Now I look at these things and it's just a great old thing. And it's really what recommends this conference to me. When I got there and found this out, I'm like, I get it. It's 50 years old for 50 years since 1973. These people have been having this conference and I guarantee you, 60% 60% of the people at the conference here were at the first one, right? These, and, and then the population of people there, now they look like a bunch of retirees walking around in flip-flops with Hawaii shirts, but then you ask them, who'd you work for? Well, Lockheed, who'd you work for? Oh, I did. I was at Sandia for my career. You know, boom, 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 boom. These are intelligent people of a wide variety of disciplines that is important to, um, to the machine including uh, physics and manufacturing, uh, plasma physics, all of that comes into play. And you had those people there. They were also people who had a very open mind, if you will. They were credentialed, but had an open mind. That's why they go to Tesla. They think Nikolai Tesla was on to something. And as Malcolm would say, um, he stands on the shoulders of Tesla and another half dozen 20th century um, uh, scientists who all of them ultimately were smeared to some degree or another for working in this area. But, but, but no, I wouldn't say all of them. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer was uh, one of the people he stands on the shoulders of, because he wrote the first paper on plasmoids, which is uh, sounds like a funny science fiction movie, but that's an actual physics term. And plasmoids manifest themselves in ball lightning, for instance. They can be made in laboratories, and that's a coherent uh, plasma structure. And plasma being the fourth state of matter, you know, you got a uh, solid liquid gas and plasma, and then a plasmoid is when that plasma takes form and maintains itself over time. And basically that's a smoke ring. Just think of a smoke ring. So you try to form smoke rings with the plasma and that's what Malcolm says he can do. So we go out to Tesla tech and the damn thing worked. Yep, And it worked and it worked and it worked. And I spent four days with the machine. I didn't have any particular skills. So I was the guy that held the exhaust analyzer on my knee so that you could see it when it was being filmed. So it was not a very, uh, you know, high tech job. But what I saw on that exhaust analyzer time and time again is that the internal combustion, small generator, 439 cc's or something like that. And I think it can put out you guys help me 1500 or 15,000 15 kilowatts probably here. Yeah. 15 kilowatts, 15,000 volts. So the thing's things about this big, you buy it at Lowe's. Okay. And just the basic engine. And then what Malcolm does is retrofits it with a series of apparati, which exploit his greater understanding of plasma physics and plasmoids. In other words, He figured all this shit out a long time ago. Then, as he'll tell you, and he told Joe, he went off for seven years to write his notes, literally on an island alone in the Maldive Islands. And when I was first getting to know him, I was still skeptical about this stuff. I'm like, hey, Malcolm, send me a picture of a coconut. 
You know, if you're really over there on your private island, I want to see a picture of a coconut. Actually, what he sent me back was a picture of the little provisions truck where they were giving him his monthly provisions. And they had a truck, like, with everything he needed for a month. So he really does live on an island. So he went out there for seven years, figured all this stuff out. But then he was approached <clears throat> by uh, an element of the government that asked him to take the greater principles that you have understood about plasma and uh, zero-point energy is a good Googleable term. And Malcolm, <clears throat> make for us, for our government, make a internal combustion engine that doesn't pollute. Can you make it? Was a but uh, and he said, you know, Malcolm's terms. But I've shown you we can make the Bendall turbine, and we can do the basically the Widencliffe Tower Tesla's thing, and we can do all this. And they said, no, Malcolm, we didn't say. We said, make us an engine that doesn't pollute. Can you do it? And he said, well, I think I can, mate. Give me a few months. And he came back four months later with the apparatus I'm describing that you can go see on the internet now, which is um, a retrofit that involves some rather mundane parts. And those parts were assembled, put together by people who had never met Malcolm out in um, <clears throat> Albuquerque. Then we turned the machine on it and it worked. And then we completely disassembled the machine twice and ran it under all sorts of conditions over three days. Now, this is redneck testing in our parlance down here. This is not the kind of shit that y'all do. And ultimately, it's going to get there. But this was a public demonstration. and But it had a quality to it where you're like, this is for real. I'll give you just some other kind of redneck takes on this. Is that when we, you would turn the technology on, you couldn't smell the engine anymore. That was a hint right away that you're running it in a confined space. We were in a loading dock in the back of a hotel. And somebody noted, they said, hey, it doesn't smell anymore. And you're like, holy shit. And then you go smell the exhaust and it does, it smells like slightly burnt air, ionized air. Okay. And it eliminates entirely um, CO2, carbon monoxide, and free hydrocarbons. So all the nasties, the bad, of course, I don't believe that CO2 is a pollutant or toxic, but we know what's going on there. You don't, we'd like to get rid of it just to shut people the fuck up. Right. And so it takes out all the CO2, takes out all the carbon monoxide, takes out all the room and maintains the level of oxygen at 20%, which is atmosphere. So it, it's a non-polluting engine. And then people always ask, well, does it run better? You know, does it run longer? Right. Is it a free energy machine or just a non-polluting energy machine? And again, they didn't challenge him to build something that would run longer on a given amount of fuel. That wasn't the, the spec. The spec was, we'll pay for the damn fuel, just make something that doesn't pollute, right? Probably for a submarine, right? So, <clears throat> so that's what he did. And that's why this thing looks so ridiculous. You know, you look at the pictures on the web and I could show you one. Well, in fact, here's a component right here, gentlemen. There right? it is. Yeah. Yeah. It also does make now, it a little more efficient, right? I mean, the tests that... Uh... It does. Well, I was going to say, Ben, as kind of a sidebar, and I won't qu quote figures because we're still... Pe some people are still working through that. But it did run more efficiently, somewhat dramatically, like would uh, make it very easy to meet the cafe standards. They could bump them up another 10 miles an hour and be no sweat. But he's not trying to achieve that. He was trying to basically transmute the elements of the exhaust back into oxygen, which is, you know, what do you do with that? And I tell you, and I've spent now this year, I counted up the other day, uh, 49 days with Malcolm Bendall. And did that because I like him, but also did that because I wanted to get to the bottom of it, man. Just personally. I might not be able to convince somebody else, but I just wanted to get to a place where I felt it was either true or untrue. And my hypothesis now is, and I mean that literally, my hypothesis is in the classic sense that it, it, that he, it is true, that he can do this, that he is that person. But I'm still constantly, I'm still trying to falsify my own hypothesis now. But I didn't have that hypothesis till I saw it work in Albuquerque. And now I've seen subsequent data from elsewhere around the country 
from another set of people who are doing uh, much more sophisticated tests. And that data is very interesting as well. So it's a long way of saying, I called Malcolm. I said, what do you think about Ben Van Kirkwitz's work with the ancient Egyptian vases? And he said, well, I know just right what they all made. I know exactly what they all. And I'm like, no shit. What do you mean you know what they are? He said, well, they're trying to communicate the technology to us. You know, it was like a baker looking at a recipe to make bread. You know, he was like, I, I know what this is all about. And we need to, we need to, uh, to say the very least, uh, pick his brain a bit more on this. But in my, uh, like I said, I don't fake this stuff very well. In my terms, what he said was that the jar, and y'all uh, uh, intuit a lot of this, and in fact, describe it this way as well, but the jar is a manifestation of math. It's a manifestation of vibration. It is an octave, is what he called it. He said that the, the equatorial plane was the kind of the yin and the yang of the thing, and that, that the equator of it was very important. And all of that could be just taught. But then he had a very specific instruction. And he said, to tell the gents to take it and submerge it in water. I imagine you could do it within a computer too. But find its displacement. And then divide that by its specific gravity. And Nick might have to help me out here a little bit. But is that right, Nick? Because we spoke briefly about this, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I wasn't taking notes. And this was late yesterday. And I was mm -hmm. running around. So there's nothing worse than somebody who recounts the most profoundly important information on earth and, you know, does it, uh, <laughs> does it poorly like I am mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. But he said, yeah, go divide that by that. And that number, that's mm -hmm. what it's all getting down to. And that, that's the end of the road for human understanding. That's, that's or maybe really, the beginning. Or maybe the beginning. That's, that, it, that, to me, I've always felt like there was something to do with the volume of these. The reason. Why would there be a reason to have different thicknesses, different uh, sizes? Oh, uh, yeah, um, yeah. You know, the wall thicknesses. Uh, it, all, it always yeah. felt to me like there was something to do with uh, acoustics and oscillations yeah. and the volume of the material that was there. Um, yeah. And, and, this, and of course that's interesting because you say that because density plays into the specific gravity and that also feels like it lends itself to the reason why the red granite. It, he said the same thing the that composition and the density of it is just seems to be what they worked on. He the said the density action. of the stone is not uh random. Like that's a key number that they had to have that particular stone or, or at least then I guess you would have the density, but then you would have to uh, manufacture something that had a volume that yes. would be appropriate to that density. Right. Right. Yeah. So one could be kind of a random number, but you got to get the other one. But, right. Yeah. To get that ratio. Correct. Yeah, right. that's right. And, yeah. and I'm telling you guys, he, he doesn't, communicate anything but with absolute cockeyed certainty and i like that about people because i'm not that way i admire that in people <laughs> i second guess my ass all the time about everything and he was unequivocal that you guys have you know answered what he said is the secret to of the universe okay and that will unlock time travel um access to other dimensions solve our pollution problems take us anywhere we want to go in the galaxy. Now we're not going to get there right away. And when I tell my friends this stuff, if they hadn't left the room yet, right. But I, I make sure to say, it's not all going to happen tomorrow, but think about like the internet. How long did it take till we got Facebook? It took a while, even though it's so damn obvious after you've got the underlying stuff, but it took 15 years to get Facebook to roll out. So I think what we're going to see here is a rollout of this technology where it's like the internet was at first, where it's like, this is not useful to me, but boy, that's cool as shit. And I'll bet you could do, damn wrap a business around that, do, do, that communications technology. And of course they start to proliferate and people use the principles to go and go out there. So I think it could take decades to make a full transition to where you're shooting around to the stars and stuff. But I think we'll know that we have something we can do it with relatively soon where you'll know that chemical rockets, you know, sell them short, you know, right. don't buy, sell. And, uh, and we need it. 
because if we ever are going to be interplanetary, you know, just chemical rockets are just a horrible ham handed way to go about it. And it sure would be nice to have some new physics. So, um, we're demonstrating this machine and I'll, I'll let y'all speak a minute just to wrap up. We're going to demonstrate the machine again in Zurich hmm. and I'm leaving for Z Zurich tomorrow. This podcast won't go out for a couple of days or I wouldn't be bringing this up because I want to get the device to Zurich and uh, probably doing a live podcast and swinging it around like this isn't a good idea. But th this is the part you can't buy at Lowe's. So you have to fab that. Yeah. So that was specially fabbed for this and sent to me from 7,000 miles away. And then I'll take it another four or 5,000 miles or whatever. And then they'll put that there. But hold on. We're not done yet with the Ginsu knives. <laughs> for that same low price, we will also add the bubbler. And this is where it gets into the theater of the absurd. Because, yeah, you got this thing, but there's nothing but metal in there. It's not, uh, there's some sacred geometry built into it. But then every other part is even the stuff you got to make, especially like this, is full of a bunch of junk from the Ace Hardware. The, 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 this is steel wool. It's just steel wool. And like fish tank bubbler in the bottom, probably, right? Uh, and the fish tank bubbler I bought when we were, yeah, when I bought them in Albu Albuquerque, they sent me the store to get a bubbler. So I bought three of them. They cost nine bucks. I think this bubbler is nicer, though. The yeah. actual thing that makes the bubbles, this is one step up from anything that's been used yet. And uh, just one, one, one more observation. So <clears throat> that thing in Albuquerque and, you know, it's elsewhere in, in the U.S. now, it is not the cutting edge of this. There, see this sphere? Yeah, I mean, it's first right? generation. So what is that? Yeah, yeah it's first generation. But um, in London right now, there's one hooked up to the grid whose sphere is this big. And they're about to light it. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> that see, we're way behind on this. The Wright brothers took off uh, elsewhere, not North Carolina this time, right? And there are more sophisticated machines uh, in Asia, Australia, uh, and like I said, there's one in London that you got to move the components around with a crane. So, it, so the results from flipping the switch on that should be uh, coming forth very soon. And if not, I'm going to look like a fucking idiot in the future when people look back at this podcast. So. <laughs> but I got nothing to lose. Okay, so comments. Ben, what you thinking, buddy? Well, I mean, I've been following this project with interest for a while. Uh, I mean, uh, you've been nice enough to, we, you know, we've talked about it quite a bit. Obviously, Randall uh, is also involved in it, and he's been involved yep, in communicating kind of the, kind of the... Um, the physics and I guess the theory behind it, there's a great resource of him. I think there's 10 hours of lectures on how to, for people that want to get into the details. Uh, for me personally, I've, I've been look, I've been looking for the tests and, and I was, you know, I saw the event in Albuquerque. I know there's some other tests going on that I've uh, some, some detail I've, I've seen of, but just, mm -hmm. just to comment about the publicly, the public stuff in Albuquerque, it's interesting. And you talk about these guys, these scientists and people that have been in these industries. I mean, these are the kind of people who bring their own, you know, gas analyzers and spectrometers to the event. Exactly and and so it's not like, you know, there's been other, there's been other new energy projects in the past. I forget the name of the Italian inventor that was trying to do cold fusion. Andrea that, Rossi. Rossi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and from what I understand, you know, the testing that he tried to do is all like, there's a red rope around it and no one could touch it. And, you know, he was the only one that was, playing with it it's very right, very man. controlled but this is this is different like there's independent testing going on even in albuquerque people were hooking up their own analyzers and spectrometers to it hell people and were like, making adjustments to the machine while he was out of the room yeah, or I mean, even when he you know yeah i mean that's it's hard to like we'll see what happens and i i'm very interested in it and i'm very hopeful that it that it is it does seem to work i mean you look at that testing and guys are like you run the generator you're seeing you know a lowered percentage of oxygen you're seeing hydrocarbons you're seeing co2 and carbon monoxide and then you turn this technology on on it and as you say the smell goes away and people are independently hooking up their own gas analyzers to it and you're like it is producing 20 percent oxygen there's no hydrocarbons there's carbon monoxide and dioxide go down to negligible numbers and i mean it's like it's it's tough to explain it kind of breaks it kind of breaks some 
fundamental yeah. sort of physics almost. It, it seems like something's and, going on. It's transmitting. I don't know, but it's like these are the results that are coming out of it and they're being independently verified. So it's, yeah, I and, think there's and here's tremendous the kind of the, promise yeah. for this tech. I mean, if it if it turns out to be legit and everything. Yeah, and one thing like for people to know too, just so it connects our two conversations here, because we certainly, you know, without tinfoil hat territory now, but um, he gives credit to, like I said, the 20th century guys, most of them smeared. And Randall. Um, and Randall. And Randall's right in there. He's the last great thinker of that crowd before, uh, and he helped Malcolm get over the line with it. They spent three months downloading, yeah. you know, and getting on the same page. Okay, but what am I trying to say here? Oh, it's all based off of sacred geometry. Yeah. Right? So their components, literal metal components that are configured very deliberately, like for instance, in one configuration that is absolutely necessary for the function of the machine, the angle of something has to be 51.8. What's interesting about 51.8, I had it up before me, and I had, that's what the pyramids are. Yeah. Right? And if it's 51.8, you know, 51, 52, or uh, 49.6, it don't work. So it almost imbues kind of a spiritual thing, Unless, not that you have to make it look like the pyramids for it to work, but we made the pyramids to look like the stuff that we knows work. And we had a podcast with Johanna James and Bob Grinier, who's part of the circle too now. And Bob, and I highly recommend any of Bob's videos or even my last podcast where you can hear him. He explained absolutely his understanding, full understanding of the form function, purpose, and operation of the pyramid using the same principles that Malcolm is using. And he understands kind of both sides of it. So they're getting back to the vases, that math is the, if you're not, that math can be used to get to the same place that he got to. And that's, that's it. And I know this is Randall's interest in it also is, is that the, the possibility that, that this technology, and this is a possibility at this point, it's just, you know, is it a entirely new invention or is it potentially a rediscovery of some technology that may have been used Thank you, ben. in the past? Because there, there, there clearly does seem to be a relationship mm -hmm. between the, you know, the principles of this technology as Bendel's creating it and some of the artifacts and architecture and, and principles behind the things that we see that come to us from the ancient past that are, that are frankly tough to explain within the context of, you know, a relatively primitive Bronze Age civilization. So, yeah, it's, it's very And he credits the ancients. He credits yeah. those 20th century guys, and then he credits the, the ancients. He says that, the, that they had this technology all in the, you know, in the uh, golden era, let's call it, yeah. as I like the kind of the precursor yeah. civilization. They, uh, you know, it got pretty much beat back there for a while after the cataclysm. Yeah. But it did hang on until the last person to have it was King Solomon. Right. In Solomon's temple. And he might have had to go rediscover it. Shamir's but then it went away that. again. Right. So, it, but, but if you go back to the, you know, golden age, <clears throat> a precursor of civilizations, et cetera, it, and maybe he would say even the, the uh, modern ancient Hindus and whatnot. But all of the mythology, all the weapon carrying of the gods, Zeus with his bolt, right. Poseidon with his trident, um, trident um, Indra, Indra, right, with um, the um, Vajra. Vajra. And that's a great rabbit hole there, man. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know that term the first time he said it to me when he said, it's the Vajra, mate. That's the thing like, that Elon Musk Audrey, has on what? his bedside table, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and 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 damn it, I don't have one here. I've actually bought a really nice Vajra, but I have it elsewhere now. And um, he says that all of that, you know, we, we all think, oh, that's ceremonial. That's campfire stories. This is their religion. And they're making things up in their head. Yeah. Nope. Mm -mm. Yeah. That is a much modified interpretation of something that actually existed that they had that let them do things like cut and move very heavy, hard rocks. Yeah. For instance, which things that have puzzled our crowd for a long time, you know, we seem to have 
perhaps rediscovered it. So that is also Malcolm would never describe himself as an inventor. He would say, I rediscovered. It. Okay. Right. Hmm. So stay tuned on that one, gents. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Anything else come to mind? You got any words that you couldn't get past me? I think honestly, the one thing that I have to say with all, all of what you guys are talking about here is that's why we feel like our uh, efforts are really important because, you know, in history, you have all of these explanations for artifacts. They were ceremonial, they were religious, they were, you yeah. know, all of these different things, but nobody yeah. really seems to have looked at them from an engineering standpoint, yeah. um, from that functional standpoint, from the manufacturing standpoint. And, you know, when you dive into these things, um, even if you only find that, you yeah. know, maybe they had higher manufacturing technology than we give them credit for, that still gives you a basis of, of context for a lot of stuff that mm. you start to be able to look at, okay, well, if this was, was produced with a higher technology, then we have them credit for what else are we attributing to historically, yeah. you know, religious or, or ceremonial stuff? that actually we should go and analyze. We should go and study. We should look at. Well, this one just popped to my head, you know, angels, angels, everybody talk about angels. Well, and I don't normally get into this stuff. I mean, I'm way into it. I'll talk about, but maybe they were aliens and you just weren't taking them seriously. And they're just describing, we see beings, they come down from the sky. They give us, a, we're still saying the same thing, but we're saying it on, you know, TV shows on the history channel. Um, Okay, gents, um, I don't know what you're doing. I know what Ben is doing June 15th and 16th of 2024 in Greensboro, North Carolina. Okay. He's going to be speaking at the Cosmic Summit. But I would like you two fellows to come with some free tickets. If you're interested in speaking, I might be able to find some time for you. But please know if you can get to Greensboro, um, you're coming free and you're sitting up front. Okay. I think, I think and, Alex and uh, Nick would be great speakers to add to the roster. Yeah. Recently. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Y'all want to do a tag team? Can yeah, can, yeah, can Chris come too? Can Dad come too? Maybe. It'd yeah, be... yeah. We'll see if we can we'll really? make him drop. <laughs> okay. It hey, there yeah. are four major interstates uh, uh, co converge right there at the Cosmic Summit on forty and eighty five. But so that's June fifteenth and sixteenth, the Cosmic Summit. You can find it at CosmicSummit dot com. Uh, tickets are selling. Uh, but we're not advertising it very hard right now. We're about to kick into it. Um, but, uh, the hotel block has been opened up. It's $179 hotel rooms. Uh, we got a limited availability of a special Atlantean ticket right now. That's going to come with VIP benefits, um, that later is going to call some people. And we've got some surprise entertainment, uh, in the works, you know, for the evening. And we're going to have a huge disco party. This hotel happens to have a legacy disco from the early eighties or whatnot that holds 1000 people and right. you will wow. not believe. So we're going to have, yeah. And we're sponsored by a uh, social house of vodka and we're going to have the cosmopolitan. All right. <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to have a really big time with the cosmic summit crew from this year and additional guests like you all, if you're interested in additional speakers. Yeah. Excellent. Thank yeah. you for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, don't mean to pop that on you out of nowhere. You got to check your calendars and with your wives and all that kind of shit. I know, but, uh, but, uh, we'll stay in touch and I can't thank y'all enough for coming on and Ben, you're a dear friend and we got a lot of investigating to do in years to come, buddy. And I want to keep working with you until you have to change the name of your podcast to charted check. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's been charted. There ain't nothing more. No more X's. We've solved the equation, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I just just on that, and just to to wrap up for me, I mean, I I do want to say I a couple things, which is you know, for, I mean, a big thanks to to Nick and Alex and the team, and particularly also to the the Vase owners who, without those guys, yeah. right now, I mean, those are the artifacts that we've been able to to do this work on, and thanks to nick and alex for roping me in and letting me document kind of the work that the the team has been doing and and get it out there uh you know going forward i know this the the this the vase scan team these um that project is you know we're making inroads hopefully we'll be able to scan more artifacts we're working with uh you know some people in egypt and we're trying to get access into museums that's an ongoing project but you know, it's it's not it's by no means done just yet, right? We, we've 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 expanded the data set, but the, the goal 
and I know the goal of the team is, is to is to is to keep going with that and and you know um, get a lot. Well, more listen, I, I know y'all are going to communicate plenty on it in the future, but but hold some back for the summit. You know, if it's <laughs> uh, if it's reasonable timing, and come tell us what you what what you've done, and at a very least, if you do, um, when you are ready to report the further analysis, come back on and tell us what you found, and let's yeah. do another you know, a part two of this, well, you, uh, working off of more than one vase. Well, if you get these guys speaking at the summit, it's great. They can cover the vases. I can go back and talk about the labyrinth and a few of the other things that I'm, that I do. It's just hey, like the cool. vase is only one part of it. That'd be. That's yeah. right. Because yeah, yeah. you did vases last year. And I also highly recommend Ben's, um, talk on the vases, a, a tale of two industries that he gave at cosmic summit 2023. And all of the cosmic summit is available on YouTube. Yeah. You can watch all 20 hours of it. If you were so inclined. But if not, you can go watch Ben. It's free on YouTube. Thank you, fellas. Very much appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, over and out. All right.